here. Can you hear me? I'm no. sitting up. No. No. Now try it. Now it is Tom Duggan is a former member of the Lawrence School Committee and former political director for Mass Citizens for Marriage. He has been a reporter and columnist for the, the Massachusetts News, the North Andover Citizen, Rumbo Newspaper, and the Lawrence News. He has also been a talk show host and producer for various radio stations. Tom is currently publisher and owner of the Valley Patriot newspaper and has been a talk show host on WCAP in Lowell for the last nine years. Please welcome Tom Duggan. Thank you. Get a little bit of feedback to we'll try and take care of that. Appreciate everybody being here. Um, a couple things that I wanted to talk about today, actually there's three things that I wanted to talk about, I'm probably not going to get to all of them. So before I get into um, the biggest part of my presentation, thank you, so uh, before I get to the biggest part of my presentation, um, I mentioned a little bit earlier when Paul Craney and, and um, Mark Lombardo were up here speaking uh, about circling the wagons and shooting in, and um, the Tea Party and conservatives eating our young. Uh, they, I, I can't stress enough, even though we talked about it a little, bit, a little while ago, how important that is. But I also want to bring up something that I think is, that is just as important before we get into this. Um, you know, we've got a state senator up in our area named Katie Ives, Katie O'Connor Ives. When I first met Katie Ives, she was a uh, she came on my radio show and described herself to me as a left wing left left wing tree hugging liberal, and then asked me for my support. And I laughed about as hard as you guys did, right? So um, then, I, then I interviewed her, and I started talking to her. And it turned out that um, Katie O'Connor Ives, even though she was a Democrat running against a very conservative Republican named Sean Toohey, um, all of my Republican Tea Party friends jumped on board with, Scott, with uh, Sean Toohey um, without investigating his background, investigating what he was really about. Um, he was a Republican, and they were going to support him. And when I finished interviewing Katie Ives, who is, um, by the way, has a 70% rating by Mass Fiscal Alliance, I think that might be one of the highest of any of the Democrats. Uh, Paul can, uh, Paul can uh, correct me if I'm wrong about that. But I bring this up because I ended up campaigning for Katie Ives, and I'm gonna, uh, this year, end up campaigning for her again, as well as state auditor Suzanne Bump, and I wanna tell you why. I am probably to the right of everybody in this room. I know Van Dover Teen suspended from her ball. What happened? Um, the video's trying to jump me first. Um, and then I want to tell you why. You know, when you get a state auditor like Suzanne Bump, and she goes up there, the sober driver is among those now being punished. She goes out there and um, she commissions a study and she does an audit of the EBT program. And she released her audit of the EBT program and was attacked by the government <coughs> Deval Patrick administration. They basically said she was lying, she didn't do it right. She stood by her ground as a Democrat. She was able to get something accomplished that a lot of Republicans, most Republicans, would never be able to get accomplished, even if they had won that position, because she's a Democrat. And Katie Ives, our state senator, can um, stand up at the Senate floor, and she can champion things like public records. I know somebody was talking about the public records law. We're in court on two different cases right now on public records. I can't tell you how helpful Democrat, left-wing, tree-hugging Katie O'Connor Ives <coughs> has been. Because she's a Democrat, when she introduces legislation that a Jim Lyons or Mark Lombardo would submit, it doesn't get buried in committee because they need her vote. They need her vote on budget stuff, they need her vote on all the other uh, green energy stuff, all of the... Um, all the left-leaning left stuff that the Democrats love to embrace. So, when I had the opportunity to look at Sean Tuohy and Katie O'Connor Ives, and this year when I have an opportunity to vote for Suzanne Bump versus whoever the Republican's going to be, uh, I see tremendous value in not tagging Democrats. It's not the Democrats that are the enemy, it's the Democrat leadership that's the enemy. It's the enemy. And if you talk to any moderate Democrat or even a conservative Democrat in this state, they will tell you 
that there are many more state representatives and state senators who are Democrats, who are conservative, or who are moderate, but are afraid to vote the way Katie Ives votes because they want a leadership position or they don't want to get attacked by the leadership. So I, just, I wanted to start off with that, and I know most people will probably disagree with me. Um, again, I'm to the right of most people here. I'm pro-life, I don't even make exceptions for rape and incest. I'm pro-death penalty, I'm anti-tax, I don't know almost anything you could imagine. However, we're never gonna get someone who's 100% agreeing with us all the time. And when you have someone who's a Democrat who has conservative values, who's willing to stand up and fight for those values, there's a tremendous value to that because the Democrats need them on their side and other stuff. And they're gonna have to let the bill that they, and right now our bill, um, and I forget the number, I apologize, but our bill on public records is, is making its way through the committee. It's gonna get a vote. Um, we have a public records law in this country, in this state, I'm sorry, that um, basically doesn't mean anything. It means nothing. It says that if you submit a, a FOIA request, public records request, that your local mayor, your local state representatives, your local government agency has to give you the documents within 10 days. We did that about a year and a half ago with Lawrence Mayor Willie Antigua, who um, was smart enough to read the statute and realize that there was no penalty. The legislatures, the lawyers, the legislative lawyers wrote a public records law to make it look as though the public has the right for transparency to get copies of public documents about how your public money is being spent. And they never put in an or else. So in other words, we have Lawrence Mayor Willie Lantigua receives my public records request for how much money certain lawyers are making off of the taxpayers, Lawrence, and he basically refuses to comply. We send a letter to the Secretary of State's office and they sent him a really harshly worded letter. Bad Willie Lantigua, bad. Give him the documents. And of course, he ignored it. We get a letter from the Attorney General. Bad Willie really Lantigua. We're ordering you. And of course, they're ordering him with no authority. Because there's not one thing in our public records law, Mass General Law, Chapter 66, that says if a public official refuses to give you the documents, what happens? Nothing. So we spent about $43,000 in the last year and a half, uh, the Valley Patriot has been seeking public documents. We've gone into court in this uh, Superior Court, and we have an order from Judge Murtaugh, who said, bad Willie, <laughs> you better give him the documents. And he um, violated three of those orders. We then ended up in front of another judge, Judge Robert Canetta at um, Lawrence Superior Court, who again said, bad Willie, you better give them the documents. But there's never an or else because in the statute, they never put a penalty. Now imagine if there was no penalty for paying your taxes. Like you have to pay your taxes, but if you don't, that's okay. Uh, rape is bad, but if you rape, it's against the law. But if we catch you raping someone, there's no penalty. See, a law isn't really a law unless there's a penalty for violating it. So our Mass General Law Chapter 66 isn't really a law. It's a suggestion. It's a suggestion to local officials, a suggestion to government officials to please give the documents if someone asks for it, but if they don't, that's okay. It's Katie O'Connor Rives, the Democrat, and Democrat Diana DeZogley in North Andover, and Republican Jim Lyons in Andover, two Democrats, one Republican, who are pushing to get a, a penalty to our Mass General Law Chapter 66. If you really want to make a difference, stop picking up the phone or sending emails to your state reps and saying we need, and I don't care what the language is, but we need some kind of penalty. So if an elected official, a public official, refuses to comply with a public records request, it's not the taxpayers that should have to pay a fine. It's the specific individual who is in charge of the documents who refuses to turn them over that should get a fine. That's, <coughs> that's what we're pushing for. So I wanted to start with that before we get into the big stuff. Um, that's still going. Huh? Just give me one second to figure out which one of those, which one that is. There we go. Nesson is terrible. I'm gonna have to just cut Nesson out of the uh, out of the project. I want to show you a couple of videos. Um, how many here remember the story uh, not too long ago, maybe about three or four weeks ago, 
about North Andover high school volleyball player Erin Cox, who was suspended from her volleyball team as captain um, because she drove her drunk friend home from a drinking party. Anybody? Yeah. Oh, good. Everybody knows the story. You're going to love this. <laughs> so let's watch the first video. This is from CNN. Uh, local girl, Erin Cox, from North Andover, my hometown, where my office is. And I just kind of want you to pay attention to the language that's being used and her side of the story that's being told. Sure, we had it all queued up. The other one was running when it didn't want it. A teen who went to pick up a friend who had too much to drink ended up getting in trouble herself. Police showed up at the party that Erin Cox went to to get her friend. Her mom says police cleared her and agreed that she was not drinking, but she was suspended from the volleyball team and demoted from her role as captain because of her school's zero tolerance policy for student leaders on alcohol and drugs. We've raised our girls, you know, to be kind, loyal, compassionate, and to always be, be there if someone is in need. If a kid asks for help from a friend, you don't... By the way, this is Wendy Murphy, you know, the famed attorney Wendy Murphy. She's um, big on um, fighting for the victims of child molestation, um, victims of uh, domestic abuse. She's very famous, very well known. Um, she was representing the Cox family in this. I want that friend to say, sorry, I can't help you. I might end up in trouble at school. She did what she thought was right. And By the way, one more thing I want to point out. Can you read this at the bottom, teen who drove friend home suspended? I just want to point that out. I think so. Proud of her for that. Family filed a lawsuit over this and started a petition. District officials are not commenting. So that was CNN. Uh, we bounce over to um, Fox. And this is one of the local Fox affiliates, but the Fox National, all the Fox affiliates carried it. Fox Boston here carried it. All right, Julie, thank you very much. This next story has a lot of people talking. A high school student in Massachusetts is being punished for making sure someone didn't drive home drunk. 17-year-old Erin Cox says she got a call from a friend who had been drinking and asked for a ride home from a party. Well, Erin drove to the house to pick her up. Then moments after she arrived, when he showed up, and they busted several kids for underage drinking. The school has since demoted Cox from captain of her volleyball team and suspended her for five games. If a kid asks for help from a friend, you don't want that friend to say, sorry, I can't help you. I might end up in trouble at school. The school officials say the 17-year-old was in violation of the school's zero-tolerance alcohol and drug use policy. Really interesting because North Andover doesn't have a zero tolerance policy. Hmm. Right? We all sat there and we watched for five First student being punished for trying to do the right thing. Sorry, this was also a Good Morning America. It was on Fox, MSNBC, ABC, CBS. It was in the Wall Street Journal, the LA Times, the New York Times, the Boston Globe. It was on, it was covered by every major television station, every major newspaper, every major radio station. All of them, including my radio station. <clears throat> the problem is, none of it was true. Not only was she not driving her friend home because she was driven home by her parents after the cops showed up, not only was there no zero tolerance policy in North Andover, but Aaron Cox last week walked into uh, Lawrence District, Lawrence District Court and pled guilty to not only being present at the underage drinking party, but having consumed alcohol at the underage drinking party. Now, this is a story that was not leaked to the press by the school. When I first saw this story, my first thought was, oh my God, somebody leaked a story about an underage minor on television, and now this poor girl has to be nationwide about this accusation against her. She's never gonna be able to get her reputation back. I was aghast by it. Until I realized, after watching the fourth and fifth, and by the way, you notice they all use the same quote from Wendy Murphy, yep. the same B-roll footage of the high school, and these are competing radio stations, newspapers, these are competing television stations, all using the same exact information. This wasn't a case where a high school kid was outed by the school, or someone in law enforcement leaked it to the press. This was a situation where Erin Cox's mom went out and hired famed attorney Wendy Murphy 
to shame the school into changing their decision. Because a year earlier, our football coach, Coach Rafferty, was fired by this very, state, this very North Andover High School, very same high school. <clears throat> and the public outrage about Coach Rafferty being fired caused the principal to rehire him, setting up a precedent for when Erin Cox gets caught by the police at a drinking party, for her mom not to go out and hire an attorney to sue the school because she believed her daughter. And I think at the beginning she believed her daughter and that's why she did this. We'd all do that for our kid, right? But she hired a media lawyer. She hired Wendy Murphy to go on Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, and all of the rest of them with her phony narrative. And here's how they got away with it. They got away with it because Aaron Cox is a minor. So they could go out and they could say anything that they wanted, knowing that the schools couldn't dispute it because if the schools disputed it, they'd be violating that minor's privacy. Legally, if the principal or the superintendent had gone to Fox News and said, this is just a lie, it's not true, and tried to prove it, they'd lose a multi-million dollar lawsuit. It would never even get to court. They'd end up having to settle it out of court. So the Valley Patriot did, a, um, did some um, research on this. We found that Aaron Cox's mom had gone into court and filed a TRO a week prior to the media blitz that you guys all saw. Didn't say anything about her daughter not being charged. Didn't say anything about um, her daughter um, being innocent. She talked about how she was there to drive her friend home. By the way, the friend, the friend was never found. The friend was never found. Okay? Now, if I was called to a drinking party, if, if I called Christine Morabito and said, I'm drunk, can you come get me? And she came and she got in trouble because she was there to help bail me out. I would be the first guy on Fox News saying, hey, wait a minute. Please don't blame her for my indiscretion. As a friend, as a good friend, I'd be on Fox News and CNN and say, hold on a minute. Erin Cox is a hero. She was there to save me. That never happened. Here's what else never happened. Not one member of the press. CNN, MSNBC, LA Times, Wall Street Journal, Boston Globe. Not one bothered to pick up the phone, call the North End of a school system and say, do you have a zero tolerance policy? Can we have a copy of it? We'd like to actually work it into our story. Not one. So they took the story of, a, of an attorney who represented one side of the story who fabricated a zero tolerance policy that didn't exist, who said that she was only there to pick up a drunk friend that didn't exist, who said that um, she was um, being treated unfairly by the school, which wasn't true, um, and that um, Aaron Cox was a good kid who didn't drink. And not one of them picked up the phone to, fit, to find out if it was true. They took the story, put it on television, and the other news outlets saw Fox run the story and said, oh, we need to run this story too. And they didn't do their homework. And they ran with the same story with the same lies of a zero tolerance policy that didn't exist. They ran with the same story of this poor girl who was being victimized by a school system that was out of control. How does this happen in a free country? How does this happen? We watch the news and we expect that what we're watching is real. So myself, and I'm on the radio, Jeff Cooner on RKO, we see the story initially and we go on the radio and we're calling for the superintendent's head. We're calling for the principal's head. In fact, I offered on the radio to organize um, a, a recall petition against the school board members because they sat silently through the entire thing and had nothing to say. Until we started doing our own homework. And North End of Apache did their own homework. They actually were the first ones to start to break this. Uh, they actually did something revolutionary in this business. They picked up the phone and called Superintendent Hutchinson and said, can you show us your zero tolerance policy? Here's the North Andover patch story. It's dated, um, uh, I can't say the date, October 15th. October 15th was right in the middle of all of this media blitz that was going on. And even after they published this online, Fox News and CNN and MSNBC continued to run their stories about a zero tolerance policy that had already been proven not to be true. 
Because if they come out and say, oh, by the way, we're going to tell this story, but we have to change something, there's no zero tolerance policy in North Andover, it's not really that much of a story anymore. Right. We as conservatives have started to think like liberals because we're in a liberal media outlet. We're in a liberal media environment. So we start to have knee-jerk reactions the way liberals have knee-jerk reactions. And we have these certain dog whistle phrases that we respond to without even thinking about it. Zero tolerance policy is big in the conservative movement. I think zero tolerance is ridiculous. I think most people here probably think it's ridiculous. But nobody bothered to do the homework. We heard zero tolerance, Fox News heard zero tolerance, Wall Street Journal heard zero tolerance, and they just ran with it. This wasn't a case where this young girl was outed by an evil school system or even an evil media. This was a situation where the parents and the lawyer put this 17-year-old girl out there with a false narrative. And then when the Valley Patriot came along and actually did the, did the work, did the homework, what we found out was what they were really trying to do was make this about Title IX, sex harassment, which she claimed in a temporary restraining order that nobody in the press was, it was right there in the court. We went down to Lawrence District Court, in fact, Alan Mills, my attorneys here, went down to Lawrence District Court uh, on my instructions and I told him, go down and find every document you can find about Aaron Cox and the Aaron Cox situation. He came back with a packet this thick, it was a temporary restraining order that the mom had filed against the school. What she was trying to do is stop the school from suspending her daughter from the volleyball team until she could file a lawsuit. She was turned down. She turned down in the first court because it was the wrong court, the second court because Wendy Murphy never showed up. Her attorney never showed up, so they threw it out. And within the documents of this TRO complaint that they filed, right here you see, it was about Title IX. It was about the football player that had been suspended the year earlier, which the coach ended up getting fired for. Because he was at, this football quarterback was at an underage drinking party. And the football coach decided rather than going through the regular process, he was gonna bench the kid for the Thanksgiving Day game and not tell anyone. So the principal fired him. And the public outrage, no one knew that story. We found that story out by going through the Erin Cox documents. She cited that in her documents and said Erin Cox is being picked on because she's a girl. There was none of that on CNN. And by the way, that TRO was filed a week and a half before CNN and MSNBC and Fox News did their report. <coughs> but they bothered to pick up the phone. One person, Shepard Smith, comes on Fox News and starts talking about this. The guy's got like 15, 15 college interns. Not one of them could have called Lawrence District Court and said, are there any documents, can we get them? Not one of them called the superintendent of schools and said, you have a zero tolerance policy. We want to look at what we're reporting before we report it. This is what we're consuming. When we're looking at the liberal media, and I saw the, uh, the buttons, the liberal media, the, most of the media is liberal. But they've learned that we, we respond to the same dog whistle type stuff as liberals do. Liberals respond to things like green energy. Right? You talk about equality, you talk about racism, you talk about um, income inequality. Those are all buzzwords that liberals, like a dog whistle, will immediately run to. And they'll defend whoever's talking about it even before they do their homework. We have to stop doing what the liberals are doing. The only difference is we have a different opinion. We have zero tolerance. Fox News has zero tolerance. They didn't even bother. They didn't bother to look it up. They ran with it because it fit their narrative, our narrative. And at the end of the day, liberals know this. I've seen at least five stories in the last two years that the liberal DNC, the Democrat National Committee, fed these bogus stories out to conservative media, watched people run with it so they could come out later on and say, look, it wasn't even true. And then they come out with their proof and say, it was all a hoax. Look at those idiot Tea Party people. Those idiots at Fox News, they don't know what they're talking about. And they destroy our credibility, but they use us to do it. I mean, we're complicit in this because we're not thinking. What, if, if, you take, if you take nothing away from what I speak about today, it's that we need to question everything, not just the other side. When we're reading a conservative, when you read the Valley Patriot, I publish the Valley Patriot. And I say this on the radio all the time, okay? You know what I want you to do when you read my newspaper? Don't believe any of it. Go online and look it up. Do some cross-referencing in your free time. If there's a story in here that you find particularly compelling, 
Don't just repeat it to your friends, call them to talk radio and say, oh, isn't that awful? Do a little bit of research. I'm human, I get things wrong too, right? Sometimes I, like everyone else, answer that, those same types of dog whistles. Whether it's voter fraud, whether it's zero tolerance, whatever the issue happens to be on the right that we care about, that we embrace, we have to make sure we have our ducks in a row. Because it's the liberal media that's gonna define us if we get it wrong. By the way, not one, not one media outlet other than Boston Sports this morning. Since we came out with our story that Aaron Cox confessed to not only being at the drinking party, but drinking at the drinking party. <laughs> not one legitimate news outlet other than Boston Sports bothered to correct what they told you for five straight days. There are people going about their lives believing certain things because they saw it on the news and it must be true. I'm here to tell you, most of what you see on the news isn't true. If it is true, it's worked into some kind of an agenda so that the story is really about something else. Um, I had somebody, um, a conservative, unfriend me on Facebook and attack me on Facebook because I was being mean to <coughs> poor Aaron Cox. We were all kids. We've all made mistakes. You're ruining her life. That's a conservative who is having an Egypt reaction to emotion the way liberals do. Because we're all people, we all have emotions, and liberals know how to play on those emotions. But it wasn't Tommy Duggan that ruined her life by calling her out and finding out that she lied. It was Aaron Cox who ruined her life by lying to her parents, lying to her attorney, having her mom go out and spread this false narrative, having her lawyer, who I'm convinced knew at least some of this wasn't true, she certainly knew that there was no zero tolerance policy when she was on CBS and NBC and MSNBC and Fox News talking about a zero tolerance policy. She, as the lawyer, she didn't even do her homework. She created a media narrative. Yeah. Uh, uh. Quick question, man. Um, when she, after she filed that paperwork in the correct court mm -hmm. and she did not show up, yeah. did she ever show up in court ever again? No, the uh, Judge Kennedy gave her, I think, was it 10 days, Alan? Gave her 10 days to come back and refile. She just totally evaporated. But totally evaporated. Wendy Murphy evaporated. Yeah, right. that's right. And Wendy Murphy also totally evaporated from this story, as she did with the Duke Lacrosse case. Wendy Murphy was the one that was claiming the Duke Lacrosse kids um, had gang raped some girl right. and went out and fed this narrative to the liberal media. See, she's a media person. I don't think she's driven by ideology. She's driven by her client. If she's got a client that's got a conservative message, she'll use the conservative media to help her client shame the other side into settling. And if it's a liberal movement narrative, like Duke Lacrosse, well, it's the war on women, right? We'll give that to MSNBC and CNN, let them run with it. And they didn't do their homework either. Uh, yes? My part of the story was the policeman wrote a letter saying her story was true. Was, is that true? Was there a letter? Yeah, well, that, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, Boxman Police Officer Brian Neely, um, let's see if I can find it here. Probably can't read that wrote a email. This is one of the things that was used in court for the TRO. It was also was used in almost every story, although I don't think it was in the two stories I showed you. Boxing Police Officer Brian Neely, who was there in charge of the 41 students that were at this underage drinking party, wrote an email to the school on behalf of Aaron Cox that basically said uh, when he arrived, uh, that she had no alcohol on her breath, she seemed steady on her feet, and she seemed as though she had not been drinking. He didn't send it from a Boxford Police Office, a Boxford Police Department email account, though. He sent it from his personal email account. And he didn't say she wasn't drinking. He didn't back her story that she was there to pick up a friend. He reiterated that she told him that she was there to pick up a friend. And that was twisted in the media later on to say that the, that the the police officer backed her story, she was only there for a friend. Well, how could he know that? He arrived a half an hour or an hour after she did. How does he have any personal knowledge as to why she showed up when he showed up an hour later? But the media never said anything about that. And even today, even right now, the national news media and most of the local news media, even now that we have corrected the story, now that we've gone out and put the right story out there that she confessed, 
there was a TRO. It was really about trying to file a multi-million dollar Title IX sex discrimination case. And it was really about shaming the schools knowing that they couldn't respond. Only Barstool Sports, and it was just this morning, Barstool Sports has the, the if you go to Barstool Sports, I think, dot com or Barstool Sports Boston, um, we're, we're their lead story. Congratulating us for at least doing our homework. I don't do this for congratulations. I do this, what I do with the Valley Patriot is to hold other members of the media more accountable. Because if they see that there's a guy out there that can shame them by writing the real stories, and it's gonna make them look bad because they're not doing their homework and not writing the real stories, I'm hoping, and at least locally it's made a little bit of a difference, that they're actually gonna start doing their homework. Somebody else had a question? Well, are you done? Because we only have 10, we got 10 more minutes, minutes. Okay. so I know you have a lot of more material. No, I, 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 I have tons, but I'll take, uh, I'll, I'll, I, I think the, re the, the reason I wanted to, to go through this is because this is just one example. I could come in here and give you two more hours of 20 more examples just in the last two months of stories you've seen on TV that aren't true. How do we fight it? First of all, if you want to be a citizen journalist, just start doing some homework. And it's really easy. Google, call your local school board, call the local port. You see a story that might interest you, that you want to report on, that you think maybe, you know, sounds like they're not really telling us the whole story here. There's an accusation against the guy, but we don't know. You call the court. So are, are there any documents on this? There, Chief Allen, how much did it cost us for those documents? About $30. 30 bucks it cost us to get this TRO. It was the best publicity we ever got. It was the best $30 I ever spent. CNN didn't do it. CNN could have had a Pulitzer Prize story had CNN called the Lawrence Court and got a copy of these documents and blew this out as a Title IX story, because that's what it really was. It was a Title IX story. Fox News could have had a Pulitzer. And if you guys want to be citizen journalists, if you guys are interested in making our liberal news media, mostly liberal news media, but even the conservative news media, more responsible, more accurate, more interested in telling the truth than getting a quick hit on dog whistle issues like zero tolerance, it's super, super easy. I'm not a genius, trust me. I'm probably the dumbest guy in this room. I really am. It doesn't take a genius to do it. But you can Google information. You can, if you get a friend that's a police officer in a certain department, or a friend that's a teacher in a certain school, call them off the record, ask them, hey, what are you hearing about this? And if they're hearing, hey, there might be something more to this, start digging. Write it on your blog, and forward it to guys like me. There's a lot of guys out there like me, who have small conservative newspapers that really are interested in the truth. Because if you can start filtering it through us, through the smaller uh, blogs, the smaller newspapers, we can filter it up the, up the food chain. Um, you know, I've got a friend at the Boston Herald, I've got friends at the Boston Globe, I've got friends at uh, most of the TV stations in Boston. That's how, that's how you fight back. You don't fight back against Fox News, you don't fight back against CNN, you do it at the local level. Whenever you see a local story go viral, just start doing a little bit of research, because I guarantee you 99% of the time, the national story got it wrong. Or they got a major element of the story wrong. In this story, they got it all wrong. Every single element, if you took notes, every single element of this story was wrong. All of it. And how did they get it? A lawyer who represented a client, who has friends in the media, who has a contract in the media, fed it to the press, put the buzzwords in, made up zero tolerance, didn't even exist, she just put it in because she knew Fox would run with it. We all consumed it. And how many other stories are there out there? How many? I can't even tell you. you. I don't want to depress you. But I would say that 80 to 90% of what you see on TV, it's just a lie. The only way to correct that is you guys. You guys have the knowledge at the local level. Wendy Murphy didn't know the guy, the security guy at the Lawrence District Court. I did. And I called him and said, if you see Aaron Cox come through your doors, I want you to send me a text. And he did. And then I started texting friends of mine that are police officers that I knew were important on criminal matters and said, Erin Cox is in the building. She's probably being arraigned on her underage thing. Can you get over near the, near the um, juvenile side and see what you can find out? And they did. You guys have the greatest network in the world, your friends and family, the people that you grew up with, the guy that you know that works at the court. Call them, ask them off the record. 
Once they give you that information, now you know where to go. Now you've got, a, now you've got something to track. And you can make them more responsible. I know we've certainly made the Lawrence Eagle Tribune way more responsible than they've ever been. Because they know if they get it wrong, within seconds, I'm gonna have the right story up online. I'm gonna call their sources and ask their sources, were you quoted correctly? Most of the time they say no. Did they get the story right? Most of the time they say no. Will you talk to me on the record? I wanna correct it for you, and they will. Um, Time? How are we doing on time? 10 minutes. I got 10 minutes, okay. Yep. Um, last night, I'm gonna wrap up with this. Because this goes along with media. I've been doing media for a very long time. The news media has these obsessions. Even Fox News, I put on in the hotel. I'm staying here locally and put on the hotel. TV last night, I put on local Fox News Boston. One of the stories was about um, um, New England Patriot player uh, Gronkowski. And we see that story was in a bar a couple of nights ago or a week ago, how long it was. He was joking with an Asian guy. He was, you know, making some kind of racial jokes like, oh, you like a, you like a sushi. I think we were doing that, that last night at the sushi bar. Right? Off the record. Off the record, of course. <laughs> the guy he was joking with was Asian and didn't have a problem with it. But it was on Fox News last night. How is that news? How is that news? Every single night I put on I watch all the news stations because that's my job. And there's at least one story about somebody who said something that was insensitive to gays. They said something that was insensitive to blacks. They said something that was insensitive to Latinos. How is that news? When, I mean, when I grew up, I was taught sticks and stones. Sticks and stones will break your bones, right? Names will never hurt me. Today, a name makes the news. How is that news? Because the liberal premise in the media, even those who work in conservative media, a lot of them are liberal, and a lot of the producers are liberal, and they still have this premise in their head that we have to protect women. They're shrinking violence. I thought we were supposed to be equal. We have to protect gays from awful names because then they'll run home and they'll cry, right? Wow, is that a stereotype? We have to protect blacks and Latinos from racially insensitive language. Do we? I, live, I grew up in Lawrence. I heard the N-word 5,000 times a day before lunch by Latinos calling each other the N-word. And what's sad is I have to say N-word, right? There are words that we're not even allowed to say if you're a certain race. Why? Because that's the construct the media has set up. Every single time, in fact, last night at one in the morning when we watched Fox News on, at the hotel, and I saw the rebroadcast of the news, and they did the grunt house thing. You know what the next story was? There was a lesbian bartender, a lesbian waiter, waitress, waitress, who someone left on her, a note on her bill that said, we're not gonna give you a tip because we don't agree with your lifestyle. That was on the news. I think how, how was that? I was a waiter for like four years. I can't, if, that, if that's news today, I'd probably still have some of my own receipts of some of the stuff that you put on it. But it wasn't about my race, so I guess that was okay. It wasn't about my sexual lifestyle, so I guess that's okay. So you can insult somebody today. You can call them a no good effing SOB and your mother is a whore. That's okay. But if you call somebody a fag, that makes the news. Every time you see it, you want to make a difference? Every single time you see it, run to your, news, run to your laptop, fire off a quick email. Two sentences. I just saw your story on whatever. How is this news? This is not news. Think about the police officers that were shot at, um, people who were killed in Afghanistan, uh, a missing child. The three minutes they spent on Gronkowski and the lesbian last night on Fox News Boston, and I'm only picking on them because that's what I was watching, um, they couldn't have spent that three minutes telling you about a kid that's missing, telling you about a woman that's missing, telling you about somebody who's got Alzheimer's that walked away from a nursing home, something you could have actually done something about. Why do they do this? Because while they're talking about Gronkowski, while they're talking about the lesbian, while they're talking about somebody who made an insensitive comment, they're not doing any work. That doesn't take any work at all. They go on Facebook, they see a story about a waitress, hey, that's great news, I don't have to do any work. Send them an email and ask them when they're gonna stop doing some work. Because they didn't do any work on Aaron Carls. They didn't do any work on Gronkowski. They didn't do any work on the lesbian waitress. And I feel bad for the lesbian waitress. 
But you want to know the funniest part of all of this? This is what I'll wrap up with. I'll take a, a minute or two of questions. At the end, and I don't know who the broadcaster was. Good for him because I'd say his name out loud. At the end, they wrapped it all up with um, something to the effect of, I wish I'd written it down. Um, the anchor looks into the camera and says, but I hope she really understands that there are more good people out there than bad. <laughs> really? <laughs> because I watch your channel every night and all I see is bad, bad, bad. And when you turn on BBC, you see what's going on in Syria and Iraq and Afghanistan and Africa and starving people and people killing each other. It doesn't seem to me like there's more people out there that are good than bad, but that's my opinion. In fact, that's an opinion, period. So why is a news guy talking about it on what's supposed to be fact and news? When you start responding, as Mark Lombardo said to state reps, they listen. When you send emails to the Eagle Tribune, the Boston Globe, the Boston Herald, Fox News, CNN, they listen. If they get one, they probably won't. If they get five, they stop paying attention. If they get 20, 25, 30, they start changing the way they broadcast. They start changing the way they, they, they cover stories. And if you really want to be a citizen watchdog, if you really want to make an effect, going after CNN is not going to do it. But doing it at the local level is. Uh, John, and by the way, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I think you and Adam hit on two very important things. And first, I, don't, I, I think the reason why the, the media reports crap is because it sells. Because we consume it. I mean, if, if nobody bought, bought it, nobody watched Fox when they were talking about Gronkowski. I mean, the second you said Gronkowski, my ears went up. I'm a football fan. I'm a huge Pats fan. I'd read that article in a second, and, 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 whether it's true or not. I, I mean, I would go to it. If it was about another terrible thing about someone with Alzheimer's walking away, I'd scoot right by it, right? So that's, that's the reason. I think what's relevant here that Adam hit on and you hit on is Valley <coughs> Pantry is extraordinarily good at this, so I want Tom's feedback on this. Us as bloggers and us as citizen journalists, there's nothing more important than the headline. If the headline didn't have the word Gronkowski in it, goodbye, I could care less. Right. You know what I mean? How, Tom, how do we, as citizen journalists, how do we get that headline? How do we get them, how do we get them to take the bait and then, and then keep them engaged past the first paragraph and whatever's bolded? Like, what, you do that very well with your paper. How do we do it as citizen journalists? How, how do we, what, just, do you have any thoughts on capturing people's attention? The reason why those um, articles sell is because the headline is very good. The headline captures your attention. Um, do you have thoughts on, and, and, and Adam said, you know, the headline that he writes is the hardest part for him to write. That's because you gotta, you have to capture people's attention in a very small amount of words. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any thoughts on any, anything that you use to do that or what, what, advice you can give us on capturing people's attention from the headline to get them to read more into what we're writing so that it is as engaging as Gronkowski says a not a nice thing to somebody and therefore you should read it or something like that. Well, there's a few things that always sell, sex, yeah. puppies, children, yeah. all right? There's uh, some Valley Patriots in the back. State Senator Bruce Tarr helped us with the Pause Act, no matter whether you're a liberal or you're a conservative. Whether you're a Democrat or an Independent or a Republican, most people like dogs. Most people love puppies. Most people respond to sexy images. That's why they're everywhere. You pick up a man's magazine, Playboy, what's on the cover? Sexy woman. What's on the cover of Cosmo, ladies? Sexy women. It's not interesting. Sexy airbrush women. Well, sexy airbrush women, <laughs> nonetheless. So the knee jerk stuff, that's what the liberals ply on. Uh, what I try to do is I try to plan that a little bit. We'll, we'll use puppies and we'll use kids and we'll use that kind of stuff. Um, but I think this kind of goes to what you were saying. Uh, I don't know if you can see that. Uh, this is from, you guys keep, telling, keep getting told by the mainstream media there is no voter fraud. Two words, certified forgeries. Mm. Let them say in front of me there's no such thing as voter fraud because you know what I did? We have the most corrupt mayor in Lawrence. Well, the most corrupt mayor in Massachusetts name is Willie Lantigua. Right. Right? 96 forgeries on his nomination signatures. The Eagle Tribune didn't go down and look at them. His opponents did not go down and look at his nomination signatures. They knew they were running against a guy who had been corrupt for 20 years, and even his opponents didn't go down to the Lawrence City Hall and ask for copies of his nomination signatures. 
There's nobody out there doing the research, folks. The most important thing you can do is research. And it's not hard, it doesn't take, it, this took me five minutes. I walked down to City Hall, I gave them $5 for the copies, they made Xeroxes, I brought them home and I started looking through them. And there's a bunch of these in the back. Um, 96 forged signatures, 96. And by the way, you'll see, when you look at the check marks next to them, Willie Antigua's election department certified them all as good. Yeah. Certified every one of them as good. Tom, how does that go nowhere? In other words, you got it right, right. there. How does that go nowhere? Because one thing that you need to understand about the press is that government doesn't respond to the press. They don't respond to complaints. So we can write all the forgery stories that we want. We can write all the forgery stories we want, all the corruption stories we want. If his opponents don't file a complaint, it's not going to go anywhere. And if his opponents do file a complaint, it's probably still not going to go anywhere. But at least you filed the complaint and you've pushed, moved the football forward a little bit. So that has to be our call to action. We see something like this to actually call up and complain about what we're reading about the Patriots. You've got to do something about this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, call us. I mean, look, call us. Call your local news newspaper. Call your local radio station. Say, hey, I got information. How did you determine the report? Um, it's funny because um, I had an attorney call me and ask me that very question. He said, did you hire a um, signature expert? Did you? Uh, the reason I put it on the front page is because it's so obvious that all nine of these were signed by the same person. It's so obvious that even the guy who was going through it, who was putting check marks next to their name. I mean, when you look at it. When I tell you they're forgeries, it's a good question. But when you physically actually look at it, it's, it's so patently obvious that the same person signed all of these. And yet, someone in the Lawrence Election Department put check marks next to every one of these names. I guarantee you that's going on in every town that you live in. You have nomination signatures, candidates get lazy, their supporters get lazy, they go, oh, I know Christine, she probably signed my papers, I'll just put her name down. Better if we just have a paper that you sign by the Secretary of State here in the state and just have money, like say, state representative, $500, state senator, $700, governor, $2,000, something like that. I'm not sure I, I need to send the question. In, in, well, that, in, that was taking place in, I think, in Maryland. In, in New Hampshire, you can either get the signatures or pay again on the ballot. You have one or either. Yeah. You have either way so, to do it. Right. Yeah, you need to understand, the news media has sold us out. They've sold us out for ratings, they've sold us out for money, and they've sold us out for ideology. They can't be fixed from within. Even Fox News, which is better than all the rest, are still terrible. They're still terrible. They just look good compared to everybody else because they're less terrible. But let's not confuse that with good. Let's not say Fox News is awesome because they're not awesome. When I put on Shepard Smith and his first three stories about Lindsay Lohan and Charlie Sheen and, and what was the other one? Um, there was a, a, those kinds of stories, that's not news, folks. That doesn't affect people's lives. That's lazy journalism. The only way it changes is with us at the local level. Thank you very much. I know I'm over my time, everybody.